Okay, everybody, here we go. Pashas Lach Lecha, we're going to start on time today because last week we went late. And, um, and, and it's game seven of the playoffs, and I got places to be. No, well, I'm not kidding, it's game seven. But, uh, but I, the, I don't really care. Uh, yeah, Phillies, I don't really care. Okay, so this class is going gonna, is gonna to tie into the current situation in Israel for a couple of reasons. Yeah. You know, being that, I don't know when you're going to watch this video. Today's October. Um, 24th, 2023, right? You know, maybe someone watches this video in two, three years. They're going to be like, oh, what are they talking about? So first of all, it's going to talk about strife. Um, and second of all, it's going to talk about the land of Israel. And we're, and we're going to go back in history uh, a ways. So let's talk about um, harmonious relationships. And usually when you talk about harmonious the relationships or lack thereof, usually we think about marriage and, and when you ask somebody, what type of marriage is a good marriage? So, I don't know what other people would say, but a lot of people would say that marriage without argument, a, a smooth sailing, couples that fight don't have a good marriage. If you had a good marriage, I mean, that's, that, would, that I would say is usually, you know, people get along, you don't fight. Usually. That's usually... Um, the, the, the mm -hmm. argument, if, the, if there's tumult, if there's chaos, if there's bickering, then it sounds like it's a recipe for, recipe for disaster. Now, I don't watch all these reality shows of, you know, the couples and how they get set up, the rows and all these. And, and, every day, and every day there's another one. Just like wrestling. But yeah. I don't know how it works over there. But so I guess the question for discussion, we're going we're, we're gonna to pick it up over here at page 40, is what type of marriage would you prefer and why? What kind of relationship do you think is a good, is a good relationship? So we're going to talk about relationships between, between God and man. And then we can translate it between man and man. And we're also going to talk about the land of Israel. Now, obviously, being that I'm wearing a yarmulke and tzitzis, so I'm obviously Jewish. And you obviously know really? where where I stand on this. Not obviously, but I think I, um, I, I you guys know where I stand on, on this issue. Which I, issue. I just think oh, the Israel issue. Oh, okay. I, I just think it's ironic. I think it's ironic that you know if Israel was being attacked by atheists or Hindus or Buddhists who don't believe in the in the in the Bible, or as the Gentiles call it, the Old Testament, then you can say okay, there's a fight of who. Who owns the earth? Who lo owns the land? But the, the the interesting part of the situation is you have these people that are not just religious people; they're fanatical, and they go to the letter of the uh, letter of the Torah, and in the Torah it says, "I'm giving it to Abraham's children," and Abraham and and says we're learning about in next week, where God tells the, uh, um, Avram, "Ki be Yitzchak ikari lechazara, Yitzchak will be your child." Your child. But this week, in a few times, not in one or two, a few times it says in the, in, in the Torah portion that the land of Canaan, later to be called the land of Israel, is going to be given to the Jewish people. So in the beginning of the Torah portion, Hashem tells Avram to leave Haran and go to, and go to the land which he chooses. He doesn't actually tell them which land it is. And then when he gets there, you see text 1a, Hashem tells Avram, I'm going to give you this land. Um, I will give the sorry, not give you the land. I will give the I will give this land to your children, and then another time, another time in the in the Torah portion, he text one B, and God said to him, "I am your God who took you out of Ur Kastim. Avram is originally from Ur Kastim. I think it's further further west, and then Avram moved, um, uh, sorry, further east. Sorry, Avram moved more west to Haran, and then he continued." more southwest to, to uh, Israel. He said, I am the God who took you out of Ur Kastim. Now, why do you say that? Because Avram survived a, an attempt on his life. Nimrod threw him into the furnace and miraculously Avram survived. He said, I'm the God that took you out of Ur Kastim to give you this land as an inheritance. So being that you've been to the class one or two times, you know that one of the standards have been said Nothing in the Torah is by coincidence. 
everything in the Torah is exact, the wording. So if you look at text 1a and text 1b, and what differences do you notice? Okay. Okay, Ira has one. one. B yeah. Starts with Bayomer. Okay. But text one A starts with it got up here. Okay. Is like at the end of the sentence. Okay. No, not what I was looking for, but a good point. Something else. <laughs> Well, that's all I got. <laughs> well, it says in 1A, I'm sorry, gentlemen, I'm reading the English. My Hebrew was not that good. Uh, I will give this land to your children. And then in 1B, it says, oh. I took you from or custom and grant you this land. Oh, see. So it's not... He goes see, from children to... You want to you wanna read the Torah portion this week? You, you gotta, you're doing better than the guys. You're right. <laughs> do, you, do you want to sit here for an hour and a half while I read one sentence? <laughs> Listen, for Yom, we're already used to Yom Kippur being a long service, right? <laughs> um, okay. So, to, yeah, we have a few differences. Number one, in one text, it, it, the land is promised to Avram's descendants. Another one is promised to Avram. But one reading does nothing, doesn't, um, brings up Avram's past or custom, the other one doesn't. And most importantly, this is what we're really going to focus on tonight, is one text presents the land of Israel as a gift. I'm giving it to you. Another one presents it as an inheritance. So, which one is it? Yes. Both. See? Uh, Michael J. hasn't lost his touch. Yeah. If I that I am running, that's running through my mind. Yeah. In both cases, it's being given as a gift. But in one, it's saying that it is for an inheritance. It's something you're going to bequeath, bequeath right. to your children. So it is in your possession, and it is yours to give. So first, you have to have it in your possession in order for it to be an inheritance. Yeah, you have to you have to own it okay. in order to give it. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so this, interestingly, obviously, this is not by by coincidence. The fact that one time it's a gift, one time it's, it's possession. The commentators pick up on this little nuance and and say that the the gift and the inheritance are for, are referring to do two different times the Jewish people came to the land of Israel. So there were two massive um, entries into the land of Israel in Jewish history. Well, the second one was massive, but it ended up. The first one was with Joshua. The Jewish people came out of Egypt with Moshe. Forty years later, Joshua brings them into the land of Israel. Okay, they're in the land of Israel for 800, 850-ish years. I mean, around there. Give or take. Give or take. Give right? or take a week or two. Exactly. Exactly. Off by an hour. Then the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. Jewish people go to Babylonia and to Persia. And then Ezra bring the Jewish people back. So, so, so the commentators say there, th these two terminologies, gift and inheritance, refer to those two different entries. One, the first one, which is the entry with Joshua, is, is, that's when it's a gift. The second one, where it, 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 with Ezra, is an in, in inheritance. Now, this is brought up by a rabbi, I don't know if I, I've mentioned him a lot here, sorry. Okay. This rabbi, he was called the genius of, of Rogachev. He was a kid, his name was Yosef Rosen. He had, aside from photographic memory, the man was a tremendous scholar. He, had, he was one of the, one of the rabbis that, that gave the, the rabbi smicha. Never got smicha from multiple rabbis. He was, he was one of them. He didn't give a lot of people smicha. He was one of those people that had very, very long hair. He does a, does a picture of it. It's called the Ravich, Ragachev Agoy. He was a rabbi in the city called Vinsk. Just if you want to, anyway. So you see, there's a, there's a biography of him on page 42. Yosef Rosen, Ragachev Agoy. And he says like this. Um, God had previously announced 
a promise to give Israel to, to Avram as a gift. However, the second promise refers to conquering which was which was in, in inheritance. So, so, so what, what Hashem, what the Rebbe points out, what the Rugged Shavar is saying here is that after Hashem gave it to Avram as a gift, he then he then further promised him as an inheritance. Now, what's the, what's the difference? What's the difference between an inheritance and, and a gift? No. Well, well, I'm going to say one is when you're getting it the first time, and one is when your heirs, your children's children, are receiving it. Or your children. Yeah. Okay. It was 850 years, so you know. Yeah, a, a few children's. So in the first, in the first one, the first text, that was just a conversation that Hashem happened to be talking to to Avram. Said. By the way, I just want you to know I'm giving I'm giving this land giving this land. The second text we read is toward the end of the parsha, where where Avram and Hashem make the covenant between the parts. Are you familiar with this uh, covenant? Avram, Hashem and Avram make a covenant. And it's been a year, so anyways, Hashem tells Avram. This is this is why we do the class. <laughs> Wait, so how many covenants did? Hashem make. Wasn't there a covenant made uh, at uh, the sacrifice of Isaac? No, the covenant was made before that. that wasn't, no, there wasn't a covenant made then. Oh, okay. I, Hashem, makes, Hashem makes a bris. A bris means a covenant with Avram, this parsha. And the next week's parsha, you have the covenant of the Mila, which is to fortify, certify what is before. Oh. So in this week's parsha, we have the bris ben Abbasar. It's called the covenant between the parts. So basically, Hashem tells Avram that I'm telling you, you're going to have a lot of kids and everything's going to be wonderful and it's going to be... So Hashem, Avram says, yeah, but what if my kids aren't wonderful? What if my kids are miserable? Right? It's very easy to make a covenant with a guy that you trust. You know, I don't need a promise, I trust you. I'll lend you $20. It's not a contract. I don't need to sign a contract. I trust you. Right? So, Hashem, so Hashem and Avram make a, co- a contract, a covenant. Hashem commands Avram. Now, I know this is very three and a half thousand, four, four thousand year, you know, style of covenant. These days, we probably just sign a contract. Yeah. In the old days, they, you know, king, king, you know, they didn't do that. It so, may be a semantical thing as far as your, your description goes, but there's a difference between a covenant and a contract. Covenant is supposed to be irrevocable. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I was using contract, contract as can be right. I, I was using contract as a joke. Yeah, yeah. Covenant is irrevocable. That, that's the idea. That's why you make a covenant. That's a, that, that, so Hashem tells my, Hashem tells uh, Ram. I'm a little ahead of myself. I said Moshe. Moshe is not is, is not born yet. Hashem tells Avraham to take um, I forgot which animals and cut and, and cut it into three parts. And then Avram would walk in between the parts, and then a fire came from heaven and passed between the parts. And Avram, it says a great, um, Avram falls a great slumber and darkness. In, interesting, by the way, the the, the Bereshis Rabbah says it's not in the book, but the the Bereshis, the, the the Midrash. So every book of the Torah has a book of Midrash on it. So, and it's usually called Rabbah. So Bereshis Rabbah, actually art scroll went and translated it. It's very, very interesting. It's not cheap set, but it's a very, very, very good work. Well, if you want to know, sometimes I quote these Midrashim, and like, where's the rabbi pulling this out of you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I don't just make it up, or I, I didn't I didn't see it on uh, online, you know. Uh, so, Bracious so Rabbi, the Midrash says, that, interesting, that there are four languages of, of, of terror or fright some that, 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 that describe when um, Hashem tells Avram, about the future. Hashem, Hashem told Avram basically the future of his descendants. And he says there are four, there are four, um, four languages of, of fear, fright. So one is, one is, um, one is um, Babylonia, refers to the exile of Babylonia. Second one is um, Modai, uh, uh, Medea. Then you have Yavan, Greece. And then you have Edom. Interesting. 
And and so in there, Hashem tells Avram that your children are going to be slaves, and I'm going to take them out with a great land, and I'm going to I want to give you the I'm going to give you I want to give you the land. You see over here, oh, Rashi says in text number three that um, Hashem showed Avram, Hashem showed all the all the exiles and the troubles that are going to happen to uh, to the Jewish people. Okay. So now, let, let, let's, get to, let's get to the difference between a gift and an inheritance. A gift, like, I, I, like Larry said about a covenant, is revocable. In a way of meaning, I know we just came from circus not too long ago. Right? It's less than a month in circus. So let's say you meet somebody who doesn't have a lulav and esrik. On the first day of, of, of Sukkot, you, you have to shake your own lulav. But if he doesn't have a lulav, how does he do the mitzvah? You can't do the mitzvah, mitzvah with someone else's, someone else's property. On the, on, on the first day. On the first day. The first day it's biblical. After that, it's rabbinical. It's on, on like a sukkah, sukkah doesn't have to belong to the person. You have to be inside the sukkah. But lulav, lulav and esrik has to belong to you. Let's say you meet a Jew on the first day, he hasn't, so what do you do? So there's something, the rabbis came up with this ingenious idea. It's called, I'll say it in Hebrew and then I'll translate it. It's called matana, a gift, amenas, on condition, lahachsir, to return. And you can stipulate, I, I give you this gift for a certain amount of time. No. Many times you give a gift and it's it. Right? Let's say, for example, the Torah we have that belongs to my father. Okay? So he gave it to us, but... It's not, I can't do whatever I want with it. I, can go, I can't go and sell it. It belongs to my father. It belongs to my family. If I want to do anything to it, I have to consult. So it's mine, because it's here. No one can take it. But, I mean, when you give a gift, you can stipulate whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. Not so with inheritance. Inheritance, the, the child just takes possession of it. There is no stipulation. See, look what the Gemara says. Text number four. The Gemara says the difference between a gift and inheritance is that a gift can be temporary, and inheritance is permanent. It says that the first recipient is a legitimate here, the second party receives nothing. This is not a gift, it's an inheritance. An inheritance has, has, no, has, no, has no end. And now we can understand, now we can understand what the, um, the interesting law, interesting idea brought up in Maimonides. There's certain laws. That are that are have to do with the agriculture of the land of Israel, right? Meiser, teruma, meiser. You have to tithe your produce. Teruma, you have to get the first one, right? That only applies when the Jewish people are in the land of Israel. Okay. According to the Rambam, we're going to read in text number five. In between the first and second temple, it didn't apply because the land didn't belong to the Jewish people. After when the Jewish people came back the second time. Now the laws apply permanently. So, for example, Shemitah. Shemitah applies. I'll look what he says in text number five. He says, All the lands that Israel came to possess when they ascended from Egypt um, became sacred. This was Israel's first sanctification. When they exiled from Israel, the sanctity of the land expired. This is because these lands became holy via conquest. Therefore, the consecration was only effective as long as the conquest. Once they, once they were, once they were, um, they failed in battle, the, the sanctification left. By contrast, when the Jews exiled, when the exiled Jews, sorry, returned and took possession of, of portions of the land, they consecrated anew, and this consecration was forever, for that time, um, and, and, and for all time. That means, and this is going to what's going on, the, you know, I was watching a, a clip of an interview uh, bless you. Was it was it Piers Morgan with BB Netanyahu? I can't remember who it was BB who it was. He was saying, you know, you say the Jewish people have been have been uh, have been there for a long time. So the Muslims also say they've been there for a long time. And your claim is they've been there for a longer time. But I mean, talking about so long a time, you know, come on. I mean, why you can't go back on that claim? So 
maybe he's answered something interesting. He says, no, the Jewish people have always claimed that there was never a time where the Jews didn't claim ownership to the land of Israel. It's always our land. Even when we weren't there, it's still our land. Right? And we, you see text number six, we say in our, we say in the, in the, in the, in the holiday, whenever there's an extra musaf, in a holiday musaf, we say because of our sins, we are exiled from our land, not from the, the land that we used to have, yeah. still, still yeah. ours, even, even, even if I'm not there. So in the, in, in the first time, that's why it's called a gift, because God gave it to the Jewish people and then took it away. But the second time when the Jewish people came to Israel, the second time it's an inheritance. And once it's an inheritance, he can't take it away. So if your last name is Gates, or if your last name is uh, Berkshire Hathaway, what's the guy's name new? You know talking about the Buffett. Buffett, 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 Buffett right? Buffett. If your Warren, last Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, your last name is Buffett, you know, you're getting a house in Omaha. It's not like a nice house, but whatever, right? Well, it's a nice house. It's, it's nothing special. Nothing special. special. Nothing special. All right. So so meaning I think he said he gave away all his money to charity. Pretty much. 95% of it will be given away to charity. 95%. What am I gonna do with five percent? No. He's already given his kids their inheritance. Yeah. Oh, all right. But let me tell you something. But, even if so, so it's still, he's still, they're still doing good. So, so the Jews were like yeah. snowbirds. They owned the land. They left. They still owned the land, and they came back. Yeah. So, um, so now, so now let's, so now let's get into the explanation of why. Why did Hashem do the gift the first time, and inheritance the second time? If inheritance is stronger than the gift. So why didn't God do that the first time? Maybe he was testing them. Yeah, or exactly. Maybe. Well, well uh, let, so this is where we're going to get into the relationships. Because remember that the, the, the connection between God and Jewish people is a relationship. And there, basically, there are two types of relationships. There is, there is the relationship of a righteous man, of a tzaddik. We, we, we learn about in Tanya, we learned in chapter one just how difficult it is to be a tzaddik. And then there's a relationship of everyone else. What's the difference between a tzaddik and, and, and everyone else? A tzaddik is a person. Yeah, I hear you want to say? No. no. Um, a tzaddik is a person that doesn't struggle to serve, to serve God. Not only that, it doesn't struggle, anything that goes against the Torah is an anathema. Is repulsive, repugnant to him. He's not, he's not, it's not that he's interested and doesn't because he wants to serve God. No, it doesn't even tempt him. It's, it's, it's disgusting to him. Like why, I think I told you the story once. So maybe it's a good story worth repeating. There was a chassid, I forgot which chassid he was. He was from the elder and tug, the, el, the elder days. When, um, when people were a little bit different caliber. And he, he's reading in the books that people have the temptation to sin. And he couldn't understand. Because here he has so much enjoyment serving God. He couldn't understand the temptation to sin. So he decided he was going to sin. He figured, if, I, if, I'm gonna, if, I'm, if I'm going to understand and be able to empathize with these people, I can't just sin like a regular sin. i got to do a proper sin. Right? So he, he was thinking, what could I sin? What's a good sin? So in the Torah, one of the things you're not allowed to do is you're not allowed to consume the fats of the animal. Meaning, the part of the our animals have to go up on the altar. You're not allowed to have that, those choice parts because that's for God. You, you have to be okay with the fact that the best part goes for God. Now in the olden days, candles were made from, from the anim, from animal fat. So he, so he decided he's gonna eat he's gonna eat fat of the animal. But this guy was poor as nothing. He didn't have meat. So he went and took a candle, and he started eating it. And I'm, I'm sure you know candles taste terrible. So afterwards he said, you know something? I don't get it. I tried sinning. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't there's absolutely no pleasure. And he said, people come to me, you know, with all these temptations. And, Sorry. You know, to tzaddik, it's foreign to him. You know, like you on the shows where they make people eat cockroaches or, or snakes. You know, you know those shows they make people do crazy bear, things. Bear grills in the, in the wild. 
whatever. Uh, what I'm saying, but you, you, in the news for you, there was something on the news a couple of days ago about a restaurant that's serving uh, grubs and, and ants and uh, worms. Yeah, it's, well, there it's are a Mexican some restaurant. There are yeah. kosher, I think. There are, but we don't know what, what, which ones there. But I remember when I was in uh, when I was I in Georgia, we stopped off in a we stopped off in a uh, in one of these small mom and pop sh stores to you know get some groceries, and there was. Uh, the impulse buys, you know, instead of having Skittles or Lay's, mm -hmm. they had a lollipop with a bug inside. I was, oh, it's so cute. You guys put a fake bug in a lollipop. He said, fake. I think it was a cricket. That's not fake. Like, people buy this. Are you? Yeah. You're right? People are crazy. So I'm saying, so the same way, Irrational. the same way we find eating a, 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 a bug repulsive, that's the way it's out of, looks like looks that's it. So to him, serving God isn't a challenge. Serving God better is a challenge. Meaning, being re-energized every day. You know, so what are they, because, you know, it wouldn't be a good class if I didn't give a sports analogy. You know, it's not, you know, once you're the champion, the challenge is keeping that motivation to be a champion again, right? For Tzaddik, he's always a champion. Then there's everyone else. Everyone else meaning... The alarm clock goes off, you're like, go to show. Not go to show. Right? Yeah, I can feel that. Make a bracha, stuff my face. Right? I mean, you can, you, 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 can go, you can go on and on and on. I mean, every time serving God. Bracha doesn't take that long. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying, you know, um, serving God is a challenge. So in, in the, to use Hebrew terms, you have a tzaddik. And you have a, a, a Baltashuv. Or the righteous man and the penitent man. In the times of the first temple, you notice, we don't, there's, you know, a lot of the laws that we have, all the Gemara, all those stringencies we're talking about, I'm not sure we learn who, all the rabbinical. Uh, about why, why ah, chicken, so right, so it was with you. So all these rabbinical prohibitions, all these happened in the second temple. All these fences around Shabbos, around kosher, all these arguments, everything happened, you know. And and even the stories you should know that we find in the in the books of the um, of the Tanakh of all the Jewish people doing terrible things. These are few and far in between. Most of the time, the Jewish people were very good people. So they were at a level of tzaddik. They didn't need extra, you know, support. Uh, an encouragement to serve God because they were serving God. Look at what uh, the Alter Rebbe writes. Alter Rebbe writes in text number seven. Uh, how come my ego? In text seven a, he says, "It's well known that most of the uh, rabbinical decrees, stringencies, and precautionary restrictions took place in the Second Temple. This is because the Jewish people were not completely free of the influence from the previous era." That means, imagine if you're a Jew who was taken out of Egypt and you crossed the sea and you received the Torah and for 40 years you learned with Moshe and you ate, and you ate mun and you drank water from the stone and your cloud protected you. When you walk into Israel, there is no one else but God. There is nothing else to do. How can you even think of serving idols? And the whole conquest of the, of the, of the Holy Land was done in a miraculous way. It's very easy to serve God. But when the Jewish people came back after the, for the second temple, they didn't come back all uh, inspired. There was no great miracle. Yeah, there was a story of Purim. It's true. But they still, like the Gemara says, very nice that we, we're, not, we're not killed, but we still serve Achishverish. We're still We still live in Persia. We still have this foreign influence. So the Jewish people came back to Israel. They, they had all the influences from the Persians, the Babylonians, and, and later, the, uh, later the Greeks. This was not the case during the first temple era. At that time, the, the other side had no control or governance over, over, the, over the Jews. That's why, when was the Siddur made? When was davening started? Set prayer for everybody. When, when did I start? Who made the Siddur? You guys know? The Anshik Nesses Hagadayla. The men of the great assembly. After the second temple. No, the beginning of the first, uh, of the second temple. The beginning of the second temple? The Anshik Nesses Gdela were, the, were the, pretty much the rabbinical establishment who, who started who, at the beginning of the second temple. 
120 rabbis. No, the reason I, when you say the sitter and, and davening, the, I, I was under the impression that that was to take place, that was to replace the temple service. It, it, it was. Because the temple was no longer there. It, 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 part of it is. So that's why we read about, that's why we read about the sacrifices. But the other things about asking God for what you need and praising God and getting all inspired and all that, and there were a lot of Jews that lived far away from Israel also. In first temple times, everyone pretty much lived in Israel. But even at the beginning of the second temple, even with the second temple, there was still a massive Jewish community in, in Iraq, in Syria, that never came back to the chagrin of many rabbis. But yeah. So there was a, there was a necessity to daven. And even, even if you, everyone lives in Israel, you can't go to the temple every day. I mean, even, if you, even by car, to go drive from Haifa to Jerusalem every day? I mean, right? Imagine what that is. You know, you, you, man, you were just in Israel. Traffic? It's a long drive. It's a long drive. So there's a concept of being inspired. So, but in the first temple, the Jewish people didn't need help with inspiration. They were able to self-motivate. They were able to focus. In the second temple, excuse me, in the second temple, they needed, um, they needed help. Look at text 7b, the Altar continues. During the first temple... There was no daily prayer. However, the more that we decline spiritually, the more, the more prayer we need to, 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 to arouse the passion of our heart and, and remove our inner dross that, and, and, um, and attach us to God. Therefore, during the, inner, the, the, the first temple era, when there was scant spiritual decline, Jews did not require passion and prayer. They were on a high. But in the second temple, during the second temple, as Asians began to introduce daily prayers. Now, the Siddur we have today... It's not exactly the way it looked then. It, things were added um, over, over time. But the, you know, the Amida, the Shema, the Amida, that was all there. Who got the publishing rights? Yeah, exactly. Um, in our day, we progressively increase our prayers and passion in each generation. We pray with more passion. This is not because we are more pious. On the contrary, the fact that you got to do more, so if, I, if I give you more instruction, it's not because... We'll use you saying as opposed to him it's because you need it if he gets it the first time and, he, and, and you don't so uh, someone else looking oh you, you know Ira's smarter so he's talking I, the Alter Rebbe looks at all the way around the fact that we needed more help doesn't mean we're more pious well l l let's turn this a lot of people say oh men are better than women because men have to do more mitzvahs than women Chassidus says no it's the other way around if you have to demonstrate, it means there's a doubt, right? People who are, let's say, talking about relationships, people that are verbally abusive or, 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 or don't pay attention and, 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 and it comes some special moment, an anniversary, a birthday, that they do something over the top. You know, like people write on, on, on Facebook, oh, my love, you know, it's my life. You know what I'm talking about? People make this whole long post about how much they love their, their, their spouse, whatever it is, and everyone else is like, bleh. Right? It says, you, know. you just flip right through it. Right. Don't even bother. I lost my Facebook account. I don't even do that anymore. But, but, the, point is, but the point is, if it's, if it's true and it's valid, you don't have to, you don't have to demonstrate. I mean, a classy, a classy person doesn't show off. A, trash, well, that, a, a trashy that, person still shows off. That and, you know, posting something on Facebook for your partner to read... Yeah, I was, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm saying, that's yeah. Really yeah. Very impressive. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm saying, but, uh, but it, I don't want her to read something. I write it down and I hand it to her. And she said, well, I can't read your damn handwriting. Right. <laughs> so, say, you know, the no, meaning. So when, when, when something, when, this goes, also goes into tznius, right? I mean, why a, 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 a person of real value? doesn't show off their externality, right? You, you appreciate the person for what they are. They don't have to flaunt their body and everything else because when something is, is valuable. You, you actually, you, you don't put it out for, for, for everyone to see. We can, give, we can give multiple examples. By the way, there was another thought of a story. There was a guy who worked in the Rebbe's house. He used to help the Rebbe because the Rebbe was in 770 for many, many hours. The Rebbe needed help. And he was also there. He helped the Rebbe the Rebbe 
So he never spoke, never ever spoke, because it was the Rebbe's private. So one time he was by Fabring and he had a few Lachaims. So one of the guys asked him, come on, tell me something. Okay, how did the Rebbe refer to the Rebbe? How do you call her? Honey, sweetie, some, something. He says, I never heard the Rebbe call the Rebbe. He said, come on, you worked in the house for 30 years. What do you mean? He said, I never heard it. He says, be honest. Say you don't want to say. Says, no, I'm, I'm being honest. He said, any time the Rebbe wanted to call the Rebbe, he never called her from another room. Whenever he wanted to speak to her, he would get up and go speak to her. I never heard the Rebbe call the Rebbe. Can you imagine? That's, that's respect. You call, you call a dog, right? I'm saying, or are your children. Are you, are you children? <laughs> But so, so the fact that we have to do more today doesn't show that we're more pious. It means we're more susceptible. That's, wh th that's why that, you know, that's why, you know, you're older than, than I am. So you'll remember what flying used to be like. It used to be, you just walk onto the plane. There was a time. There was a time, you just walked onto the plane. But then people started doing bad things. So because of because we're more susceptible to hurt. So you got to put in place more, going back to the whole Israel issue, right? Oh, we, the Palestinians live in open-air prisons and there are checkpoints and there's a wall. Well, yeah, because you were blowing stuff up and you're stabbing people. So, people. huh? Kidnapping. And you're kidnapping people. So, yeah. So the fact that there's more security, the fact, you know, the fact that it's very sad that we have to have a security guard. I used to pride myself that over here, it's a safe neighbor. Less is more. I think it's a very, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a very uh, um, strong, strong idea. So, he, so here we have, um, so here we have what, what it is: a tzaddik and a balchuv, a, a righteous man and a penitent man. A righteous man just serves God straight; doesn't need help. The, the balchuvah. It's a, every day is a fight. Which one's better? L let's look at Maimonides. So you have Maimonides says, pious people's 8A, this is 47. Pious people follow their passions and inclinations. They behave meritoriously because that's what they want. They want to serve God. Philosophers have agreed that pious are more distinguished and com complete than those who struggle to, to, com to control themselves. Why? Why? How can a tzaddik do everything right all the time? So the Rebbe Rashab in text 8b explains, because righteous people are in a constant state of unity and attachment to God. They are detached from all forms of tactile pleasure and, and certainly distant from evil. In their worship, they are constantly aware of God's divine light. So for example, if you saw everything as chocolate cake or ammonia, then everything would be a very easy choice. If you saw putting on filling in the morning as chocolate cake and and uh, doing something wrong or not serving Hashem as the equivalent of cutting yourself, it would be a very, very e easy choice. That's how they see it. That's how tzaddikim see the world. They see it in black and white. What God says, chocolate cake. What God says not to do, bleach. Don't so, mix bleach in ammonia. Don't mix bleach in ammonia. No, don't do that. Unless you're trying to make chlorine gas. Then it's okay. Well, yes. Actually, and I know about chlorine gas. And unless you want to go all World War One, and then you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Good old mustard gas. Yeah. So the so the, so that's how that's so to us it sounds ridiculous because who's like that? That's why we learned in Perak one of Tanya there are so few people like this who see the world in black and white. So to them it's not a challenge. You know you don't go today. I had a, you know I had a good day. I was, I was tempted to drink ammonia. I didn't. Everyone clap. No, you don't get, you don't get an applause for that, because obviously you didn't do it. That that's the way it's sadik. To us, should we? Shouldn't we? What do, you, what do you mean? Should you? Shouldn't? We? Like, should you go to show? If I told you, you get, you, if you get up right now, I'll give you ten million dollars. You would get up. So the sadik looks like getting up to go to show is ten million dollars every day in the bank. Not a choice. You would not sleep in. You would jump. You would. You wouldn't. To us, there's there's a doubt. I mean, and we're so sunken into our way of life, we doubt such people even exist. Because, what do you mean? Everyone's like us. But there are some people like that. That's why people would go to such people for advice. Because we are all 
tainted and and we don't see the world clearly. But here I have a person who sees what's good and bad, not skewed by anything else. I'll tell you a story. I just heard the story this week. A new one. A new story. Oh boy. I just heard the story this week. What so is it going to be on Shabbos? They're good. It, it's a good story, so I might have to. Oh, all right. so then we can say we already use. heard it, or we can sleep through it. Or you, you'll probably forget right, about it. How about just <laughs> jumping the, the punchline? <laughs> No see, see what you missed? See what you missed? No reason. Now you know why I don't use new stories, because look what happened. So Bob Dylan, everybody knows, uh-huh. is, is a Yid. He's from, he's from, uh, from Minnesota. And he, and he converted, right, to Christianity, then he came back. I think it's actually in uh, Adam Sandler's song. Bob Dylan was a Jew, and then he wasn't, now he's back. Yeah. Anyway, so Bob Dylan... We, we, his life was, you know. So he got close to Rabbi Manus Freeman. Rabbi Manus Freeman ran a school. And, 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 and his Bob Dylan was, you know, a songwriter, you know, shtickle philosopher. He had these questions. And, 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 and uh, Manus Freeman said, why don't you come, he says, why don't you come to Fabringen? Come to Fabringen, I'll have a spiritual experience. He says, I'm not going unless, you know, someone's there to translate for me. So Manus Freeman said, okay, I'll go with you. So they go to F- 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 Reagan. Actually, Manus Freeman was, was one of the ones that translated simultaneous translations into English, which if you think about it, is very, very difficult to do. Because you, un- you have to understand the words, you have to understand the concept, and put it into words, and he's doing it simultaneously. So yeah, I think I told you this before, you see videos of the guys translating, they were like shaking and sweating. It was, it, it's work. Anyway, so in, the ways for Reagan's would work by the Rebbe, the Rebbe would speak, for 20, 30, 40 minutes. Then people would sing for 15 minutes. But in between, you would have, um, you'd have a cup of wine. And you would say L'chaim. The Rebbe would, if, you see, if you see videos, the Rebbe's looking around, L'chaim, 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 L'chaim. Right? And, and when the Rebbe looked in your general direction, you think the Rebbe looked, at, or sometimes you're lucky enough, the Rebbe met your eyes, you would drink the wine. So, so, so Bob Dylan comes to him and he lifts up. And the Rebbe's here. Mm-hmm. The Rebbe is ignoring him. One sikh, two sikh, the Rebbe's ignoring him. So you can imagine, he's very offended. So Manus Freeman calls up Pinyamin Klein. He says, here, the guy came to Fabring him. And I, I actually think, actually think that the Rebbe, they told the Rebbe that he was going to be there. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe ignored me. So Pinyamin Klein went and said, you know, the guy, you know, we're here, we're, we're here, we're Chabad, we're trying to bring people closer. And, so, you know, so the, uh, so they told the Rebbe, the guy came, the, he came to Fabring him. And you ignored him. Shabbos said, he was by Fabring? I didn't see him. No, it's impossible, because you were standing like in the middle. And he, didn't, and he didn't look like everyone else. He wasn't dressed in the black, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Not like he was the only one by Fabring like that. There were people that came in jeans. And stuff. So Manus Freeman was thinking, how could it be that the Rebbe didn't see him? It doesn't make sense. There were stories where there were, there were people that came to Fabring, there were kids that would come for Fabring every Shabbos. And one week they were sick. The Rebbe asked their father, where's your kid? There were thousands of people there. The Rebbe knew who everyone was. and who. Where. So Man Shri was thinking and thinking. And then he found out that, 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 that Bob Dylan converted to Christianity. Full-fledged conversion. He said, this is what you got to do. You got to go to the mikveh. Because officially, if a person converts to another religion and wants to come back to Judaism, you have to go to the mikveh. It's almost like he has to convert again, so to speak. Doesn't have to do bris milah, nothing like that. You have to go to the mikveh. Trust me, go to the mikveh, come to another fabrega. So he went to the mikveh, and I think he was standing, the Rebbe would come in, there was a line, and um, when, the, when the, the Rebbe walked, like past him, he came back, and went like, like this time, like a big, a big smile. A tzaddik doesn't see that. He doesn't see it. To us, it, we, don't, we don't comprehend it. He doesn't see it. It doesn't exist. So that's where the joke came from. The what? Goldberg. It's very, very religious, very observant. One day he says, ah, I'm going to buy a Corvette. I'm going to shave my beard. Oh, yeah. And then he goes and he says, Yeah. And, uh, Hashem says to him, ah, I didn't recognize him. <laughs> exactly. That's where the joke comes yeah, from. Yeah, that's right. That story. So now, so I, I, I'm, so I, at first glance, it might seem, going back to the relationship question, which marriage is the perfect marriage? 
the one with no arguments, smooth sailing, that's the perfect marriage. Who does Hashem prefer? Who does Hashem love more? The tzaddik. The tzaddik. But you know, say, who does Hashem love more? The tzaddik. It would seem so. It comes to Maimonides in text, 8, text 8c, page 49, and says, penitents should not consider themselves lower than the, than the, than the righteous person. On the account of their sins. It's not true. They are beloved and desired before Hashem. Furthermore, they will be greatly rewarded for they tasted sin and it separated, conquering their urges. Our sages declared, where the penitent man stands, even the completely righteous man cannot stand. The penitent man transcends those who have never sinned, for they overcome the evil inclination. Think about it. The tzaddik never has to overcome his evil inclination. Does a tzaddik get rid of a reward for not eating a cheeseburger? No. He doesn't know what a cheeseburger is. Tzaddik doesn't know what shrimp tastes like. Tzaddik doesn't know what not kosher wine tastes like. So he should get reward. But imagine the guy who's a big wine connoisseur, right? And there's a, and a French wine from 1910, 1910, 190 whatever, right? Or something beautiful, right? And he says, no, as good as the wine is, it's not kosher. Now that's, that's strength. That's special. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a fight to it. Mamanis continues. When we examine the words of the, say, uh, of the sages, on this matter we find that we, those who feel the lure of sin are more distinguished and complete than those who don't desire it. This is true to the extent that, the, that they said that the reward for those who control their urges is commensurate with the degree of the struggle. And, and they said, in accordance with the effort, is the, is the reward. So the person who struggles, the person who has, has a hard time, that's, that's a, you know, it's, it's a self-made man, not the trust fund kid that, get, that gets respect in, in, in the real world. I saw a clip or something, I don't remember what it was. Someone from Congress was grilling one of these guys that, that is a billionaire. He said, it's not fair, you're a billionaire, you're, you're a billionaire. You just have, and your workers don't, don't, have, don't have, it's not fair. So the guy says, you know, I grew up with nothing. I live in federal subsidized housing. I, I, I had nothing. The, the money I had, because I made it, I worked hard for it. It's not like I stole it from somebody and I have to give it back. See, the, the, it, it's, it, it's, the, it's a person like that, a person that has to struggle. So now we could understand, going back to the land, right? in the beginning, it was a gift. Smooth. They came in, they fought the wars, God helped them, but it doesn't have as much, uh, as much, as much struggle. Mm -hmm. Because when something comes easy to you, Mayor, Mayor was telling me there was a guy who recently won like $2 billion or $1.5 billion mm -hmm. in a lottery, and he said he's already went and bought like properties in Malibu and this and that. He said, okay, two, three, four, five years. Not only is it gonna be back, it'll be worse. When something comes easy to you, it can, it can leave. But when you have to struggle for it, when you work for it, then it has more of a staying power. Yeah. So now, so how is the, you know, let, let's ask this. Maybe the righteous man is righteous because he never had an opportunity to sin. Maybe if he tasted, if he tasted shrimp, he would, he would, he would uh, like it. I mean, the penitent man we know is not going back because he's been there and, and he fights it. We don't know. Maybe the righteous man just is righteous because he hasn't had the opportunity to sin. This is why we're going to now explain three different ways why the penitent man is better than, than the righteous man. Let's look at what the, what, the, uh, the Rebbe says. Text 9, the Rebbe says something like, it's beautiful. He says, if your Jewish lifestyle is detached from, from worldly engagement, you're never tested. So how do you know? Maybe if you were tested, there's no certainty you would pass it. You know, penitent, that's why we say every day in davening, in the beginning on page 5, 6, 7, I think it's 8, in the, uh, in the sitter, we ask God, lowly day in the sowing, don't test us. We don't want God to test us. We don't know how, how we would react. Penitents are different. You know, interesting, in the Jewish community, when, 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 the, when the Ashkenazim were going through the Crusades and, and the forcible conversion that the church was upon them, a lot of people in the Sephardic community said, oh no, <laughs> that would never happen to us. We would, you know, push comes to shove, we would stand up. Interesting, ain't it, how 200 years later, Spanish Inquisition, and, and a, a full half 
the Jewish population in Spain converted to Christianity. And we're, not, we're not talking about small numbers here. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. So you never know. You never know. That's, we, that's what we say. You, ne- you never want to be tested. That's all we can never, we can never judge people who've gone through, who've gone through such, su- such uh, trial, tribulation. And we, the people who went, you know, the people who went to the hol- went through the Holocaust, and and and, and decide, you know, they don't, they, they can't believe in God and everything else. We don't judge them. But the people that come through the Holocaust and, and still believe in God, still put on tefillin, those are special people. You know, they they've been battle tested. You know, and to believe in God after such a, such an event. Right, the guys are going to come out of Gaza and put on tefillin. I mean, that's that's uh, you know it, 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 uh, that's special. Penitents are different. They start at the bottom and work their way to the top. Therefore, even the worst character traits become conducive to holiness. The manifestation of godliness in the, in their lives is enduring. It is never interrupted. Penitents are already tangled with the allure of worldliness. Been there, done that. Moreover, they even stumbled, God forbid, and dabbled in behaviors that transgress God's will. Despite all this, they return to God. Meaning, they're not, it, they're not religious by default because they don't know any other way. They're religious because they've been there and they appreciate. So what are you going to offer them? Another sandwich? Another pretty girl? A better drug? Nah, been there, done that, not interested. You, you, you can't break them. There's something beautiful about that. The, this demonstrates that the ethos of Torah and Mitzvahs permeate them to the extent that they cannot be separated from God. Their bond with God is, is, is constant. It is without boundaries. So for the righteous man, maybe, sorry, a little behind, maybe, just maybe, you know, th- th- there's a part of God that can't, that can't reach there. Because we don't know if he loves God that much. Does he love God at McDonald's? Right? Does he love God in... in, uh, in g- g- well, good McDonald's is in Israel. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so, and 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 now we're going to come to a, a another a, another idea. The righteous person, the righteous person, he is always a distinct entity of uh, from God, because you have him, right, and and me, and I, I and, and my love, and I choose to direct it to God. But there's me and my and my love, right? And I can choose to direct it wh- whoever I want. But maybe one day that love could be directed somewhere else. But no, I'm directing with God. But with the with the with the Balteshuva, the penitent man, the, it says it says what happened here? The the guy did something wrong, and then in his place of darkness, in his lowliness, he realized, man, I I, I gotta improve. So it's it. He found he, he found he found purity, found godliness in the lowest place. There's you know the best motivators, the best counselors for drug addiction, alcohol addiction are who? Alcohol, 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 right? Yeah. Maybe because, because because they they know what it means. Hmm? Recovered. 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 You know, by the way. You know the addicts. They say that they don't call themselves recovered. They, they always call themselves in the state of recovery, because they say the moment you think you're recovered, you can you can relapse. They always call themselves interesting. Mm-hmm. There are people who have been re- uh, recovered al- alcoholics for 20, 30 years. They won't. They still won't make kiddush on wine. Only grape juice. Because I'm a, I'm a state of recovery. Age grape juice. Age grape juice. Exactly. All right. There you go. You always check the expiration. Right. I'm not recovering. I'm having the real thing. Right. I don't. I don't have a drinking problem. I have problems. I drink. Right. Exactly. Well, like the joke we told a few weeks ago with the bottles of beer. Right. The guy who wakes up, who uh, gets drunk, and then hits his wife and smashes things in the house, and the next day he feels horrible. He picks up an empty bottle of beer and he smashes it against the wall, and he says. Says uh, you were responsible for hitting my wife. Picks up another empty bottle. Says you're responsible for me screaming at my kids. Picks up another empty bottle. And you're responsible for me breaking the furniture. Picks up a full bottle. He says you weren't involved. You stay out of this. <laughs> <laughs> you said the fridge was empty. There was stuff in the fridge, just not here. Yeah. 
So, 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 yeah. so the, yeah. so the, the Rebbe Rashab says something, and, and then you guys can read, it's a very long text, I'm not going to read it out loud, but um, he says, the in text 10a, he says, the, te, the penitent men are completely uh, subsumed within God, this is because they fell, became entangled in a state of ego, darkness, um, uh, ego, darkness and evil, yet they nullify their ego, and return from the dark with, with all their hearts. They achieve complete tra transformation. This is, this is the beautiful thing of, uh, of the penitent man. So the righteous person is the me, and then there's God. And I choose to direct. The penitent man, there's no me. Like he, he, I mean, he fell. And, 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 in that, and in that distraught state, in that lowly state, he found where he's supposed to be. Okay, let's get back to let's get back to the gift and inheritance. What's the difference between a gift and inheritance? By a gift, there's me and there's you, and I'm giving you the gift. We are two distinct entities, and because of that, I can direct tell you, you can have the gift for a year, and you gotta give it back. But inheritance, there is no. So, for example, right, according to Jewish law. A person receiving a gift might have to pay capital gains tax, right? Because he in inheritance, he doesn't have to receive, he would have to pay capital gains tax. So according to Allah, the person who inherit, there is no transfer of possession. Tra you pay capital gains tax because the money used to be yours. You paid me, and now it's mine. So now I have to pay tax on that gain. By inheritance, the child, for example, doesn't, there is no transfer of possession. He takes the place of 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 his of his father or mother before so it, it, it it's the same you see you see over oh, here the tzafnas paneach the um the rugged shepherd guy it says in text 11a the heir becomes the the testador as it were it is therefore the position of jewish law that inheritance does not constitute a transfer of ownership there is no there is no separation it's just it's one long, continuous thing. So now we can understand, in the beginning there was a gift. The land of Israel was a gift, so God took it away. But became an inheritance. Once it became an inheritance, the land of Israel is constantly being transferred. Not transferred, sorry. It's being an inherited and flowing from one Jew to the next Jew. It can never be taken out from, from the possession of, uh, of the Jewish people. It belongs to us forever. And that's why, by the way, no Jew can give it away. It's not yours to give away. The Israeli government can't give away land. All the, I mean, even if even if all the Jews agreed, still can't do it. It's not yours to give away. Let's um, it, uh, let let's look what the, what he says. A gift, the text eleven b. Um, the, the a gift is trans is is defined as a transfer of property it, that is not compelled by law. Another way to put it is. The recipient has no inherent right to the property. The property is acquired solely by, by, by the largesse of the of bestower. I feel like this is the universal term gift. The recipient right flows from the gift. Prior to the gift, the recipient had no claim. Now he does. This is clear. Right? You can't demand a gift. If I promise you to give you a gift, you can't take me to court. Your wife can wife I have no I don't own anything anyway now we you, you know that you, you know that joke a kid comes to the funeral or the cemetery he's, he's trying to find his grave his father's grave he can't find it he says he says he's looking he's looking he's looking he's looking he says he goes he goes to the office so I'm looking for a um, a, 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 a grave for a certain uh, John Goldstein we don't have a John Goldstein. We do have a Betsy Goldstein. Oh yeah, yeah that's him. He put everything in my, in my mother's nest. <laughs> <laughs> so now we come to, to a state and inheritance. The term refers to the transfer of one's property to another upon one passing. As it transfers to the heir, the estate flows from above to below. Before the passing, the heir had a vague encumbrance on the property. After the passing, it's his. It flows downstream. Uh, perpetually, this is be, this is perhaps why the Torah uses the word nachala, 
a cognitive nachal, a stream, to describe an estate. Estates are like rivers, just like a river cannot be blocked, and all rivers flow to the ocean. So too, the, the inheritance can't be blocked. I mean, if your name is Buffett, you're getting money. I, I, a Chabad rabbi once told a story where a guy came at them and said he's angry at his kids. He wants to cut them off. He said, listen, you, better, you should make up with your kids. Your kids are getting your money anyway, so you might as well have a good relationship with them. Not, nothing you can do about it. You're not taking it uh, to the grave. Or maybe that yeah. joke. The, the, woman, the, the woman writes a check. You know, you know that joke? Yeah, the guy wants to be, guy, guy wants to be uh, buried with all his money. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? There you go. So, so, so now, now we can understand. So now we yeah, can... but at least I wrote a check for double what I took out of the exactly, cash. Exactly. <laughs> so, now, so, now, so, now we can, so now we can understand. It's true the Jewish people during the Second Temple times were, weren't perfect. But it's because they had that unwavering relationship. I mean, they, they've tasted... They tasted Babylon, they tasted Persia, they tasted Greece. They said, God, we only want you. Not because we don't know any better. We, we, we know. And, and we only want you. And we, and we want the land. They were in Iraq, they were in Syria, they were, they, they were, they were everywhere. We want to come back. That, that makes the land, that makes the land ours. It, it means we're, we're totally invested, not only from a place of um, uh, from a place of holiness, but also from the penitent, which we know that a rope, once you, you, once you like, you, you, tie, you get a second knot, even if it's ripped, you, tie, you, you, you double tie it, the rope becomes a uh, lot stronger. Okay, let's look at the, let's look at the, at the key points. Interesting, number five popped up first. Righteous people are fortunate because all of their urges are holy and therefore can, they can do precisely what they want. Penitent men struggles. Penitents are struggle are fortunate because they struggle. It means they're constantly serving God. Everything's a struggle. The righteous have never been tested. Thus, we don't know. If they are tested, we don't know. The penitent man has tested, so we know. It's been there, it's been there done that. And that, that that's why you know you have uh, life insurance companies. Since 18 something. What are they trying to say? What they're trying to say is been there, done that. We've weathered the highs and lows of the market, and we're still here. Invest with us. That's the penitent man. The penitent is exclusively devoted to, devoted to God in every aspect of his life. No part of their life is separated from God. Thus, they enjoy a oneness. Not, not a, a directness of emotion like, like a, a tzaddik does. They're one. Because there's no part of him where he hasn't experienced God. The same is true about relationships. Calm, peaceful relationships are relaxing and enjoyable. Tumultuous, temptation um, relationships can strengthen the couple's bond. So yeah, obviously you shouldn't fight, but it's it's recovery from the argument and the fight that bring that bring you closer together. So let's say you get into another argument. Okay, we've been like, like, like Jackie Mason says, when Jewish couples fight, they curse each other out, and and they say terms of endearment at, at, at the same time. I can't stand you, you son of a gun, this is sweetie pie. Says I hate I hate you so much, sweetie. You know, <laughs> that's what that, that's the way it is. All right, guys. Have a good week. We should hear good news from the Holy Land and our hostages should be released. They showed pictures of the tunnels today. <laughs>